Welcome to part four of the digestive system physiology. Uh, this is the part where we actually get into all the mechanisms of breakdown and absorption of carbs, fats, and proteins. So we're going to start with carbohydrates. Uh, carbohydrates, uh, as humans, we eat them in their most digestible form predominantly, and that's the form called starch. We as humans cannot break down a form of carbs called cellulose, so um, we don't digest this. We do digest starches though, and that's what this physio is gonna be about. So starches are gonna be broken down first into what's called oligosaccharides, which are about eight glucose units long. That will then be broken down into smaller subunits called disaccharides, and then those will be broken up into monosaccharides, which is going to be our glucose monomeric subunit. The process of starch digestion is going to take place beginning in the mouth because if you recall, the mouth is where we actually secrete our first starch digesting enzyme called salivary amylase. And amylase is going to break down maybe 5 to 7% of all the starches in the food that you've eaten. The majority of starch digestion happens in the small intestine. Salivary amylase works best at neutral pHs and it's quickly denatured once it goes into the stomach because of the stomach acid. But not to fear, once the chyme leaves the stomach and goes into the duodenum, your pancreas secretes pancreatic juices, which includes an ingredient called pancreatic amylase. This is the active form of the enzyme amylase, and it's gonna take starches and break them down into oligosaccharides. These oligosaccharides will then come into contact with this brush border. And in the brush border, you're going to have three enzymes that I do not need you to memorize. But these three enzymes are the enzymes that break down the oligosaccharides into the monosaccharides called glucose. Now, a question that I often get is um, because lactose ends in os, that means it's a sugar. Lactose is a disaccharide, and if you don't have the right enzyme to break down lactose, you won't be able to break down that disaccharide into the monomeric subunits. This is called lactose intolerance. The enzyme that breaks down lactose is called lactase. Children up to the age of four um, will make a good amount of lactase, but after that it tends to decline in adult mammals. Make sure to star this slide. I'm gonna change my laser to a pen, and I'm gonna number the steps for you here. The last slide was about carb digestion, so breaking down a starch into the monomeric units called glucose. We had to break it down all the way to the monomeric units called glucose because only glucose is able to be absorbed through the um, epithelium of the small intestine and into the blood circulation. So here is the lumen of the small intestine. We're going to just draw a blood vessel here because they didn't draw it down for you. And here we go. Step number one. Sodium glucose symporter. By the way, the legend of all the transporters are here. Purple is sodium glucose symporter. You know this one. This is the one that uses the downward gradient of the sodium entering the cell to piggyback a glucose along with it. So generally, inside the cells, you have high glucose. So a glucose molecule from out here is not going to want to voluntarily enter into the cell. So we piggyback it with the downward gradient of sodium. Fructose has a facilitated diffusion transporter. And the fact that this is a facilitated diffuser means that fructose is higher concentration out here than it is in the cell. So it's gonna have no problem simply diffusing into the cell. And then we have galactose. You're gonna need another symporter for this, and that's the sodium galactose symporter. Once you've got your sugars, in the intracellular fluid, and remember these are the cells that line those villi. If you recall the villi that go like this, they had cells all around them, and inside was your blood circulation and the lacteal. 
you have to move the nutrients from the lumen of the small intestine across the epithelium into your blood supply. That's what we're doing here. We're moving glucose from the lumen across the epithelium and eventually into the blood supply. So, so far steps one, two, and three got the sugars into the cells of the epithelium. Now, if you recall, uh, glucose and galactose, these guys were in high concentration um, inside the cell, so neither of them are gonna have a problem leaving. Fructose will simply piggyback as a symporter behind them, and all three of those monomeric sugars will exit the epithelial cell and go right into blood circulation. Now, at the end of all of this, you've moved the sugars, but you've also done what to sodium? Well, you've increased the sodium concentration inside of this cell. And as you already know, cells don't like to maintain a high sodium concentration. So how do you force sodium to leave a cell? Well, sodium potassium pump. What is this pump going to require that's not written or drawn on this picture? A T P. ATP is the energy source required to move sodium against its gradient out and to move potassium against its gradient in. So again, big picture here, the goal to get sugar from the lumen into the cell, back out of the cell, into the blood. If you have any questions on this, make sure to star this slide so you can ask me about it either through video chatting or through email. Next one is protein digestion and absorption. So proteins, uh, we know that they come in units called amino acids. So you have a really long protein chain and it's connected by peptide bonds. And I already drew this picture on the last video, but I'm gonna draw it again. And I'm gonna draw the carboxyl form in its charged form this time, so negatively charged, and the amino group in the charged form as well. So here. So this is the carboxyl group on this side, this is the amino group on this side. The enzymes that break down proteins are called proteases. This is the big umbrella term, it's simply called a protease, an enzyme that breaks down a protein. Now, if you recall in the mouth, what are the two nutrients we started breakdown of? Starches and fats with salivary amylase and salivary lipase. Once we got down to the stomach, which two nutrients did we break down then? We broke down fats and proteins now because we had gastric lipase and we had the enzyme called pepsin. So pepsin is the first digestive enzyme we're gonna use to break down proteins. Pepsin is made by the stomach to work in the stomach. What does this tell you that pepsin likes in terms of its optimal environment? Pepsin loves a pH of two. What do you think is gonna to happen to pepsin when it goes from the stomach into the duodenum that has more basic pH of about eight or nine. Well, pepsin gets inactivated. It denatures, it breaks down. Does this mean we're done digesting proteins? Well, no, because the majority of protein digestion happens in the duodenum where we've secreted our pancreatic proteases. If you recall, we secreted a few zymogens the two that I'm talking about here is trypsinogen and chymotrypsinogen, but their active forms are trypsin and chymotrypsin. These two enzymes are the big enzymes that start protein digestion in the duodenum. These two enzymes simply and arbitrarily cut very large polypeptide chains. So let's say, oops, let's say this is my really long protein chain and one side was my carboxyl group, the other side was my amino group. These two enzymes will just chop 
chop, chop, chop. It'll just chop the large polypeptide into just smaller pieces. For this course, I don't need you to know exact places where trypsin and chymotrypsin cut. Just know that it cuts a very large polypeptide into shorter oligopeptides. So that's trypsin and chymotrypsin. These are both pancreatic enzymes. Now, I'm going to draw this again because this is really important. So NH3 with a plus is the amino group of it. You have amino acid, amino acid, amino acid, amino acid, and amino acid, and that's connected to a carboxyl group. So all the amino acids are connected by peptide bonds, and on one end of the, an amino acid chain is gonna be an amino group, on the other end is gonna be a carboxyl group. One of the other enzymes that we talked about that gets secreted out of the pancreas is going to be carboxypeptidase. The word peptidase just means enzyme that breaks down proteins. What does the word carboxy mean though? If I were to give you an option of saying, does a carboxypeptidase cut at side A or is it gonna cut a protein at side B? What would you say? The prefix is carboxy, so we're going to start cutting at the carboxyl terminal. Carboxypeptidases are enzymes that cut the bond of the amino acid on the carboxyl side. So a carboxypeptidase is going to cut right here. Where do you think an amino peptidase is going to cut? That's the prefix amino. It's going to cut right here. So carboxypeptidase, this enzyme is also a pancreatic enzyme. If you recall, I told you three pancreatic enzymes that break down proteins. That's going to be trypsin, carboxypeptidase, and chymotrypsin. So where are these other two from? These two are brush border enzymes. They're made by um, the enteroendocrine membrane, that little membrane of cells that had the villi on them in the lumen of the duodenum. So two brush border enzymes are gonna be aminopeptidase, cutting at the amino section, and then dipeptidase. Once you've cut the peptide and it's only two amino acids long, at this point, the dipeptidase can work. Dipeptidase will not work to cut three amino acids down into two and then one. Dipeptidase will only work if there is a single peptide bond and it cuts right in the middle of them. So when you're down to two amino acids, you use dipeptidase. And again, both of these two are made in the brush border, which is why it's so important to do segmentation and churn and churn and mix that kind within that small intestinal region. So this just shows you, um, let me get my laser pointer, three triangles in three different colors. All three of these are the three types of pancreatic enzymes. Pink is trypsin, blue is chymotrypsin, and green is carboxypeptidase. So here are very long uh, polypeptides. You have pink and blue, the trypsin and chymotrypsin. We said they simply cut the protein at any location just to make these long chains smaller. Once you get to the oligopeptide um, region or length, at this point you notice that there's a carboxyl end and there's an amino end. You then have carboxypeptidase chopping the amino acids off from the carboxyl end, one by one. From there, you have the aminopeptidase chopping off the amino acid from the amino end, one by one, until you're left with just two amino acids. Those two amino acids will have a single peptide bond in between them, 
and that's when dipeptidase comes in. And dipeptidase is responsible for just splitting two amino acids into single ones. Only when you break down proteins into single amino acids are you then able to absorb that amino acid in through the epithelial wall down into the blood circulation. So for that amino acid to go in through the top of the epithelial wall, it needs to use a transporter. And this is because inside of these epithelial cells, they already have a high concentration of amino acids. So if you already have a high concentration of amino acids inside the epithelial cell, is more amino acid gonna voluntarily wanna get into that epithelial cell? Well, probably not. So you have what's called a sodium dependent amino acid co-transporter. This is moving in one amino acid into the cell and piggybacking it with a sodium because as you know, inside the cell should be low sodium concentration. So this is like that sodium glucose symporter, but instead it's a sodium amino acid symporter, right at the um, brush border membrane up here. And then once you get the amino acid into the cell, there's again a high concentration of them in here. So is it gonna have any problem leaving out of the basal end? Probably not. So you use facilitated diffusion. That means you have a transporter here, and it's there simply because you can't move an amino acid through a lipid bilayer. So you need to transport it, but it doesn't use ATP. It doesn't require co-transport. It just diffuses from high concentration in the cell out to a lower concentration in the blood. So again, on the top of the cell, sodium um, amino acid co-transporter, and on the bottom of the cell, it's just facilitated diffusion, moving that amino acid out into the blood. The last nutrients we're gonna cover is lipids. And um, again, if you recall, where's the first place that we start breaking down lipids? Well, a little bit of a review for you. In the mouse, you make salivary amylase and lingual lipase. So lingual lipase is the first enzyme you're gonna make, and it's made in your saliva, that's going to mix with the food that you're turning into a bolus, and it'll start the breakdown of that fat content in the food you're eating. It only does about, I don't know, maybe seven or eight percent of fat breakdown, because once that food goes from your mouth into the stomach, lingual lipase is denatured, and then gastric lipase takes over in the stomach. By the time that chyme leaves the stomach, you've digested probably 10 to 15 percent of all the lipids in the food that you've eaten. I mean, it leaves a big majority of it that still needs digesting. So we have a process for digesting lipids. This is probably the most complex process of all the nutrients we've been over. And um, it first starts with emulsification. I've used this word a couple times now. And emulsification is simply taking large fat globules and breaking them down into smaller little droplets. And we do this by using bile salts. So bile, it was made in the liver, stored in the gallbladder, and secreted out into the duodenum. This bile will be responsible for emulsifying the fats. If you break down the fats into smaller droplets, you increase the surface area for enzymes to further enzymatically break down the fat. What enzyme are we talking about? Well, not lingual lipase, because that only worked in the mouth. Not gastric lipase, because that only worked in the stomach. We're now talking about pancreatic lipase. This is the enzyme that breaks down most of your fat. So using illustrations, here's your large fat globule that gets into the duodenum. The bile acid, I told you it had a hydrophilic region and a hydrophobic region. These bile acids, by the way, they're also called bile salts, are able to take this fat globule and break it down, aka emulsify it, into smaller little droplets. So instead of having just one surface area, you now have a lot more surface area in those tiny droplets.
once it's in these tiny droplet forms with a higher surface area, you are then able to more effectively use pancreatic lipase. Pancreatic lipase is the enzyme that's responsible for cutting your fats between the glycerol head and the fatty acid tail. So as humans, the majority of fat that we eat is made out of triglycerides. That means three fatty acid tails and three glycerol heads. Pancreatic lipase cuts between the glycerol head and fatty acid tail of number one and number three to create these three pieces. You make two free fatty acids and one monoglyceride. This is considered the digested version of fat. This is the job of a lipase. Now, oftentimes the question in class will be, well, professor, what does someone do if they have their gallbladder removed? Well, if you have your gall gallbladder removed, you can't store or secrete bile. So the only part of this whole process that you can't do is right over here. You will not be able to emulsify the fat into smaller pieces. What that means is that you're gonna be working on breaking down these large fat globules with these tiny little enzymes. So chances are at the end of your digestive process, you will still have broken down some fats, but getting to the core of this fat globule will be virtually impossible for pancreatic lipases. These lipases will start digesting the surface of this fat and they probably won't have enough time or enough of them to actually digest anything in the core of it. This can lead to stomach pain um, and cramps and diarrhea for people who still eat a high fat diet even without a gallbladder. Now this is where it gets kind of funky. So let's take this really slow. So you took that big fat globule and you emulsified it using bile into smaller little droplets. These little droplets have a name. The first time that you're going to be given it is now. It's called a micelle. Micelles are tiny fat droplets. When these micelles come into contact with the brush border, this is where they're going to actually um, get worked on by pancreatic lipase. And again, that pancreatic lipase will break the fat down into fatty acids and monoglycerides. You have to break it down in this brush border because otherwise these micelles are not able to cross the membrane. But if you break down a micelle into fatty acids and monoglycerides, those guys can easily just go whoop right into the cell. They do not need transporters because if you recall the lipid bilayer is hydrophobic and so are these two components here. So because they're both hydrophobic, it can just simply pass the lipid bilayer and go into the cell. So a lot of students at this point think, hey, okay, we're done. We digested it and we absorbed it. Well, this is where it gets kind of weird. Fats reform themselves into triglycerides once they get into the cell. The only reason they broke down over here is to get into the cell. Once they're in the cell, they reform into their triglyceride form. Triglycerides, phospholipids in the cell, sometimes cholesterol in the cell, these guys will all tag team together and they'll store themselves into these little storage molecules called chylomicrons. Make sure you know that word, a chylomicron. A chylomicron is a repackaged version of the triglyceride the phospholipid, and some cholesterol. Now, what does this chylomicron do? Because remember, you have what's called a lacteal, not the blood vessel. I mean, there is a blood vessel here, but that's not where we're gonna absorb into. If you recall from a few slides ago, the fats don't go into the blood. They go into specialized lymphatic vessels called lacteals. And that's what we're going to see here. The chylomicrons are going to get packaged by the Golgi and they're going to go and do exocytosis 
to release all of what they stored in them, the triglycerides, the phospholipids, the cholesterols, and all of that gets exocytosed out and it gets absorbed into the lacteal. And this lacteal will eventually send all that fat through the lymph nodes and up to re-enter back into your blood circulation. But key things here, the bile breaks down the fat into micelles. The micelles get digested in the brush border using pancreatic lipase into fatty acids and monoglycerides so that they can enter the cell. Once these enter the cell, they reform back into triglycerides. They get packaged with other hydrophobic content into a chylomicron. The chylomicron gets packaged by the Golgi to travel to the basal membrane of the epithelial cell, do exocytosis, release the contents, and they get absorbed into the lacteal rather than into the blood circulation. Again, um, go over this a few times, and if you struggle with this mechanism, please, please don't hesitate to ask me for help. Now, moving our way down to the end of our digestive tract, the large intestine. The main thing happening in the large intestine is water reabsorption back into your body. This is where you're trying to compact the feces into nice, dense fecal matter. So the inner um, lining of the large intestine doesn't have villi. We're going to just call them crypts. These crypts are pretty large. Um, they don't have any other hair-like structures hanging off of them. But what they do have in the crypts are these cells called goblet cells. And the job of goblet cells anywhere in your body is to secrete mucus. So you're trying to lubricate all this area. Why are you lubricating it? Well, because again, if this is your chyme, you're trying to move water and reabsorb the water out of it to compact it. The more compact and hard it gets, the harder it's going to be to get through the large intestine. So the goblet cells secrete mucus to lubricate the inside to ensure that this chyme ends up moving through the large intestine and making its way into the rectum. Now, the movement of that solid or solidifying um, form of fecal matter is called a hostral contraction. Hostral contractions are what we use to churn that fecal matter in the large intestine around and around to try to get as much water back into our body as possible. So hostral contractions are another version of saying segmentation. But if you recall, segmentation was the word that we use in the small intestine to churn in place. Hostral contractions are the words that we use for the large intestine to signify churning in place. Again, moving contents from one end to another is still called peristalsis. Now, all in all, you're supposed to have about one to three mass movements a day. So going to the bathroom and uh, pooping out fecal matter one to three times a day and that's just because you have major peristaltic movements one to three times a day. And then defecation, the last thing I want to say about um, the digestive system is the innervation of the rectum and the anus and the process of defecation. So for defecation to occur, your anal sphincters need to be relaxed. And the way to do that is with parasympathetic innervation. So Stretching of the rectum itself, and if I can just, oh, there's not a picture of it, bummer. Okay, let me draw it for you. So you have the rectum, you have your sphincter, and then the anus. So the rectum is covered with smooth muscle. When fecal matter comes into here, it stretches out the rectum. And the stretch receptors on the rectum will sense that it is full of fecal matter and it sends a signal up to your brain 
and your brain says, uh-oh, we have stretching of the rectum. That must mean it's full of fecal matter. And that'll send a parasympathetic innervation down to the anal sphincter to relax it. When you relax the anal sphincter, you will be able to more easily move the fecal matter through and out the anus. Now, there are two anal sphincters, an internal one and an external one. What I need you to know about this is that the internal sphincter is smooth muscle. What does that mean about contraction of that sphincter? That it is involuntary. The external anal sphincter is skeletal muscle, which means it is voluntary. Both sphincters need to be relaxed in order for that fecal matter to move through and for defecation to occur. So hopefully that illustration wasn't too elementary and it got the point across. But if you have any questions about any of these me mechanisms, uh, please do not hesitate to contact me uh, before we get to our next lecture so that it doesn't all get mumble jumbled together. Hope you guys are all doing well and had a great uh, week so far. I will talk to you soon.